This lecture will cover Introduction to Anatomy and Physiology through Body Systems. Anatomy is the study of structures within an organism. It's what they look like. Gross anatomy is studying structures that we can see with our naked eye. For example, surface anatomy, studying the outside of the body. Or studying structures on the inside of the body, like organs, such as the heart or the stomach. We can also study smaller structures using microscopes. We refer to this as microscopic anatomy. We can further subdivide microscopic anatomy into histology, which is the study of tissues, and cytology, which is the study of cells. Now, when we study how those structures function, we've now moved into physiology. So for the heart, we can study the surface anatomy of the heart. We can locate the great vessels. We can dissect the heart and inspect the chambers. We can even look at cardiac muscle tissue under the microscope. That's all anatomy. When we start talking about how the heart pumps blood through your body, we've moved over into physiology. In this course, we'll be studying living organisms specifically. All living organisms have certain shared characteristics, the first being they are composed of cells. You could be a unicellular organism and only have one cell, or you could be a multicellular organism and have more than one cell. Many bacteria, they're all unicellular, while humans have trillions and trillions of cells that are replaced all the time. Those cells are capable of metabolism, we have two parts to metabolism. We have anabolism, which builds larger molecules from smaller ones. And we have catabolism, which breaks down large molecules into smaller ones. As you can see, we consume food. And through catabolic reactions, we break that food down into smaller pieces. Your body will then take those smaller pieces, do a little bit of anabolism to build larger molecules that your body needs. Notice that catabolism releases energy, while anabolism requires the input of energy. Your cells in your body are constantly doing both anabolism and catabolism in a nice cycle. And again, collectively, we refer to this as metabolism. Living organisms are capable of growth, which means we are building more than we are breaking down. You can either increase the size of an individual cell and take one cell and it can get bigger, or you can increase the number of cells. So you take one cell and you can make tens and hundreds and thousands of that cell. Both of those count as growth. Living organisms are capable of excretion. The goal is to eliminate potentially harmful waste products. Humans excrete waste products via sweat, defecation, and urination. Living things are capable of sensing and reacting to their environment. This is known as being responsive or irritable. For example, if we touch a hot stove, the sensory receptors in our fingers send signals pain signals from our skin. We're going to send those pain signals to your brain. Your brain will quickly process that information and will send its own signals through our motor neurons to the skeletal muscles in our fingers and in our hand and we will quickly jerk our hand away. It's equally as important that we can both sense and react to the changes in our environment. If we could not sense or could not feel the pain we would not remove our hand quickly. If we could not physically remove our hand quickly enough, either would lead to excessive damage to our skin and other tissues in our hand. So again, it's equally as important that we can both sense and react to changes in our environment. If you are a living organism, you're capable of movement. We can move an organism as a whole. You could run a marathon. Have fun, I will cheer you on from the sideline. Individual cells can move. For example, the sperm. 
or we can move things in and out of the cell. We can move things from the intracellular space to the extracellular space and vice versa. We can move things from extracellular space to intracellular space. We can even move things from one side of the cell to another side of the cell. It really depends on the needs of the cell itself. All of those count as movement. If you are a living organism, you're capable of reproduction. This comes in a few varieties. We have mitosis, which allows us to create body cells. These are stomach cells, liver cells, brain cells. Literally any cell inside of your body that is not a sperm or an egg. Okay? All of that is mitosis. Meiosis is used for the production of sperm and egg only. Okay. Now, you could then take those sperm and egg, put them together, and create a new organism. That counts as reproduction as well. But if you choose to never create your own organism, your body is still constantly doing mitosis. That is still a form of reproduction. Your body is very organized. We generally start with the smallest level of organization and work our way to the largest. So we'll start with the chemical level. If everything on the planet is made of atoms, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, living things, non-living things, everything is made of atoms. We can start putting those atoms together to make molecules like water and glucose. If we create complex molecules, if we add enough atoms together, we can eventually create organelles. Organelles, you may be familiar with some of these, like the mitochondria, the nucleus, ribosomes. These are little parts of the cells that have specific functions. If we can gather enough organelles together, we can create a cell. Now we've already said that if you are alive, you are composed of cells. That is our basic unit of life. When you start putting multiple cell types together, you start forming tissues. Everything in your body is composed of only four tissue types. You have epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. When you start combining tissue types, we reach the organ level. You are familiar with many of these, your stomach, your heart, your lungs, your kidneys, etc. These have overall functions. Once you start putting multiple organs together to perform broader functions, we get organ systems. Again, you're probably familiar with many of these. Cardiovascular system, reproductive system, respiratory system. When we put all 11 body systems together, we have finally created an organism. Speaking of body systems, let's review briefly each one. Your integumentary system, your skin, your hair, your nails, your glands, protect your body. They assist with the production of vitamin D. They help you retain fluid. And they assist with thermal regulation or body temperature control. If we're talking about your integumentary system and thermal regulation, we are talking about sweating. Your skeletal system supports and protects your body, like your skull protects your brain. Provides leverage for muscles to help produce skeletal muscle movement. Your bones are involved in hematopoiesis, which is blood cell production. And your skeletal system is good for mineral storage. Most people have heard that your bones are full of calcium. That's totally true. Now your muscular system, we just mentioned, they're involved in movement. We do this by pulling on those bones of the skeletal system. Your muscles also help open and close orifices, such as your mouth. And again, we see thermoregulation, or body temperature control, but now we are talking about shivering instead of sweating. So notice we have two different body systems that help us regulate our body temperature. Your nervous system regulates overall bodily functions via nerve impulses. It also is involved in the sensation and the movement that we mentioned earlier with irritability. And it's involved in autonomic functions or automatic 
functions, also higher mental functions. Now your nervous system is a very fast acting regulatory system as opposed to your endocrine system. Your endocrine system is also a regulatory system. However, your endocrine system uses hormones instead of nerve impulses. Your endocrine system helps you regulate muscle function, gland function, and other tissue function. Although your endocrine system is a regulatory function, it is a much slower acting system compared to your nervous system. Your cardiovascular system is involved in pumping oxygenated blood to the body and deoxygenated blood to the lungs. And also in the blood, we are transporting cells, nutrients, and waste products for removal. Your lymphatic system returns extracellular and interstitial fluid to your blood. It's also part of your immune system. Many people have heard of lymph nodes. Those lymph nodes contain leukocytes, also known as white blood cells, and these leukocytes help us fight infections. Your respiratory system provides oxygen to the blood, and it also removes carbon dioxide from the blood. And your respiratory system participates in fluid balance and acid-base regulation. Your digestive system is involved in ingestion, digestion, absorption, elimination, and it participates in fluid balance and acid-base regulation. Your urinary system is involved in the elimination of wastes from the body. We do this with urine. We stimulate hematopoiesis here. Remember hematopoiesis was blood cell production. And yet again, it participates in fluid balance and acid-base regulation. Hoping that you're noticing that one must be kind of important since we have multiple body systems involved in the fluid balance and acid-base regulation. Last but not least, we have our reproductive system. We can create and transport sperm and egg, those gametes. We also have secretion of hormones. Most people are familiar with testosterone and estrogen. And we have sexual function as well. And that concludes our introduction to anatomy and physiology, common characteristics of living organisms, levels of organization in the body, and an overview of the body system.